Hi everyone. Uh, in this video lecture, I'm going to try to deal with the careers of uh, two figures at the end of the um, uh, second century and the beginning of the first century BCE, who um, in a way transformed the Republic uh, irrevocably and, and uh, brought about the beginning of the end here. Um, if Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus were harbingers of, of ter the terrible things to come, uh, Marius and Sulla opened up those wounds wide uh, to the point where they, they never were repaired. Um, uh, and so these are these are pivotal figures. Um, they're also controversial figures. Uh, their record is mixed. Um, the historians who, you know, dealt with their lives um, had complimentary things to say about both of them, and they also had condemnatory things to say about both of them, right? So um, we need to recognize the kind of mixed bag that is uh, the career of both Marius and Sulla. Um, so to start with Marius, uh, Marius rises to prominence kind of in the aftermath as things having to do with the Gracchi settle down. Um, the land commission was abolished in 119, um, but it had almost completely run its course. Most of the land in Italy had been uh, redistributed among the... Um, uh, the proletariat um, among the, the kind of poor plebeians, um, and it was a wild success uh, and extremely popular. And, and you know there were some public land still in places like Campania, um, but most of it had been um, had been redistributed. Uh, henceforth, if the Romans wanted to um, you know sort of open up new lands, this would have to be done largely through colonization of territories they conquered, and, and we're going to see some of that, and, and sometimes it's controversial, much like the land reforms have been. Uh, and so Marius um, came to the fore uh, in the one teens. Um, uh, he was a, um, he was from the Equites, uh, he was not uh, from a senatorial family, he's not a patrician, um, he is one of the more prominent novi homines, maybe the very most prominent of all novi homines in Roman history. Um, uh, he was highly ambitious, he was quite charismatic, though not a great speaker, it seems, um, and really not beholden to any kind of ruling philosophy. He was not really a great friend of the poor, even though he is styled one of the populates. Um, uh, if anything, Marius is in the camp of Marius. That's what I always say about him, right? Uh, he, he was all for his own advancement. Um, really, he is a case study in the effects of personal ambition in late Republican Rome. He was elected tribune in 119, uh, praetor in 115. Along the way, he had some military success in Spain and established him, uh, his reputation as an able commander of troops. Uh, he was also able to marry into a senatorial family, specifically the Julii Caesares, um, from whom would spring, of course, Julius Caesar. Uh, he was actually married to Julius Caesar's aunt. Um, and so, you know, this gave him money and access to the highest echelons of power um, and enabled him, in part, to, re to, to reach high office. But it was really through his military skill that he achieved great things. Um, he made his career... Um, in this conflict known as the Ugertine War. Um, and so um, we may recall that Rome had made an alliance during the Second Punic War with a guy named Masinissa uh, who became the king of Numidia in North Africa. Well, a few generations on, uh, I think it's the grandson of Masinissa whose name was Ugerta, uh, he began to interfere in Roman politics um, specifically by bribing Roman officials to do things that were favorable to Numidia. Um, at one point, Jugurtha is reputed, and I believe it's Sallust who uh, says this, is saying that all Romans are for sale, right? Um, that to, they just, we have to get the right price and all of that. And so uh, he was involved in a lot of bribery, and this included some extremely prominent individuals, uh, senators and even holders of uh, offices like Praetor and Consul. Um, and, uh, you know, he uh, did some things that, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the Ugratine War, you can read the Sallust selection that's assigned this week, um, and we can talk about that a bit more uh, over, um, well, uh, as we discuss that source on uh, Perusal. Um, but, uh, in any case, uh, this is this is the the conflict that makes Marius's reputation really makes his political career. So Rome sent troops under the command 
um, of uh, the consul Quintus Caecilius Metellus um, around 109, 109, 108 um, to uh, try to put down, well, to, to try to fight against Jugurtha. Um, uh, some of his actions had, had prompted military um military action against him, right? And so uh, Metellus goes off to war. Marius was one of his underlings um, and, uh, you know, uh, one of his lieutenants in, in his army. Um, but Marius was gunning for bigger things, and he saw that Metellus was mismanaging the war, and he proceeded to send reports back about the mistakes that Metellus was making um, to his allies in Rome, uh, this became common knowledge. Actually, Metellus confronted Marius about all of this and eventually dismissed him. Um, and uh, Sallust characterizes this. Um, uh, this is in the Kendrick and Howe book on page 88. Um, this is section 73 of Sallust. Metellus sent Marius home since he had repeatedly asked for leave. And Metellus thought that the, that the lieutenant who was serving against his will disliked his commanding officer um, was a little use to him, and that's probably accurate. Um, but all of this tearing down of Metellus was calcu a calculated effort to build up Marius, right, so that he could then run for the consulship and, with the support of allies, then gain command of, an, of the army fighting against Jugurtha. Um, and so he's successful in his bid for the consulship, in the year 108, he becomes consul in 107, and with the support of uh, allied tribunes and others, um, the command is stripped from Metellus, um, and uh, and Sallust again describes this whole process, right? Um, uh, specifically, Marius was, he, he appealed to the common people. Now again, Marius is classified as one of the Pupilates because he tended to uh, try to gain popularity with with uh, the plebeians in Rome, but um, he doesn't seem to have had any particular affinity for poor people or for plebeians in, in general. Uh, again, Marius is really out for Marius, right? Uh, this happened to serve his purposes. Um, so Sallust writes, the general, that is Metellus's noble rank, uh, which had formerly earned him credit, now counted against him while Marius's humble origin made him still more of a favorite, right? And so he uses his status as a non-senator, as, a, as an equi uh, one of the equites, um, to come to power uh, with the support of the people. Um, Salas goes on to write, but in both cases, party prejudice carried more weight than the men's actual merits or defects. Besides, radicals in office egged on the mob in every assembly, accusing Metellus of capital crimes, but praising Marius to the skies. Finally, the common people were so worked up that all the craftsmen and farmers whose livelihood and financial credit depended on the labor of their hands, left their work, and followed after Marius, since they considered honoring him of more importance than earning their living. The upshot was that the nobility was defeated at the polls. And so in the election, now this is, you know, this would have been in the, um, uh, the uh, Comitia Centuriata, the Centuriate Assembly. Um, let's remember that that voted by these centuries, and there had been some reform of that body, um, and uh, more power had been given to the, to, to the plebeians, and so Marius drew upon this plebeian support to win the consulship, uh, and Salus concludes this by writing, for the first time in many years, the consulship went to a new man, meaning a novus homo, right? Um, and then the tribune uh, puts him up to relieve the command of Metellus in the war, uh, rather than his fellow consul, who was of more senatorial rank, and Marius goes off to war. And, uh, but the Senate was skeptical of him, and so they, um, with, they, they withheld some of the funding that he might have had uh, in the prosecution of this war, and Marius made the important step at this point of recruiting soldiers from among the poor people. Not just the plebeians. We're, we're talking people who did not hold enough land to actually qualify for military service. Marius bucks that tradition and recruits actively from among the poor people, offering to pay their salaries out of his own money, which he, of course, knew or felt that he would gain by winning the war against Jugurtha. Now, long story short, all of this works out extremely well. Um, Marius 
uh, defeat Jugurtha. Actually, it was um, uh, a force under the command of a quester uh, uh, who was serving with him, a guy named Sulla, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, um, who actually uh, captured Jugurtha. And Sulla is going to emerge as this key figure, and we'll talk about him later. Um, but, uh, you know, this starts a rivalry with Sulla. Sulla claimed credit for this, but Marius got credit for defeating Jugurtha since he was the commanding officer. Um, and this soured relations between Marius and Sulla, that souring uh, was gonna gr is going to grow over time, as we'll see, uh, and lead to all sorts of problems in Rome. Um, um, but the part of the issue here that I want to point out is that Marius does something different with the military, right? He makes moves to create a professional army who is paid by their commander and thus reliant on and loyal to the commander rather than to Rome itself. Now Marius begins this trend. Sulla is going to take it much further than him and eventually this is going to become the norm for ambitious men in Rome. Okay. Um, Marius did not disband his army after the war with Jugurtha because he then went on, because he had achieved all of the success in North Africa, uh, Rome suffered a terrible defeat in the year or two after um, the Jugurthine War in southern Gaul um, against these uh, Celtic and Germanic peoples known as the Cimbri, those are the Celts, and the Teutones, um, those are the Germans. Uh, they um, uh, had allied and attacked um, a Roman force and utterly slaughtered it. Um, we're talking tens of thousands of uh, Roman soldiers died in this battle. Uh, this is thought to be the worst um, defeat um, in terms of lives lost and casualties um, uh, that the Romans had suffered since uh, Hannibal. Um, and so this is, this is a, a really important event and this caused all sorts of scandals in Rome uh, and it would, you know, the allies of Marius proposed him as the one who could uh, handle the situation. Um, and so Marius then was elected as consul in the year 104. And he hadn't completely, he hadn't disbanded his army. They were still loyal to him. He takes this force, ends up winning uh, victories over the Cimbri and the Teutones. It takes him a couple years to do this. Um, and since this, since he's prosecuting this war, he ends up becoming consul multiple years in succession. And this is um, this is a, this is new, or rather, this is um, unusual. Uh, it's not entirely unprecedented, but um, you know, Marius goes on to have the consulship for five straight years. That is unprecedented, and he does this mostly on the basis of this reputation that he's gained of being such an effective commander that nobody else can handle the military like he can, right? It's all, it also has to do with the fact that the military, or rather his army at this point, has become effectively his client army. Now, what do we mean by that? We've talked about patronage and clientage. Every soldier was, for all intents and purposes here, a client of Marius. They were reliant on him, beholden to him, loyal to him. Uh, they did his command. Um, they were not an army of the Republic so much as they were an army of Marius. But that professionalization of the soldiers, while this made them more effective, and, and Marius' army was incredibly effective, uh, it did shift loyalties and uh, sort of reconfigure the way that the, the relationship between the military and the Roman Republic, right? And that is going to have serious consequences. Marius is a precedent here. And every commander uh, after him pretty much you know, sees their soldiers as their own clients. Sorry for the yawn. Um, uh, and as, as their patron, uh, these commanders, starting with Marius, you know, see it as their responsibility to uh, do right by their clients, by their soldiers. Um, that is, they want to reward them for their service. They want to provide things like land and money um, and pensions and, uh, you know, uh, the perks, um, the benefits of having served in the army. It's no longer just you serve in the army because it's your duty as a, uh, a citizen of the Roman Republic, right? And so this creation of the first client army is an important step um, in shifting the loyalties of the people of the Roman Republic 
and in, as I said, reconfiguring the uh, sort of power relations, the relationship between the military and the Republic itself. Okay. Now, Marius did not continue in the consulship in part because while he was consul, uh, he was allied with a guy named Lucius Apuleius Saturninus, um, or Saturninus, a couple different ways to pronounce that name. Um, uh, Saturninus was, I'll go back with the original pronunciation there, uh, he was a controversial figure. He was a, he was a tribune uh, during the, uh, a couple of years actually, when Marius was serving as consul, um, and he proposed a lot of fairly radical legislation. I'm not going to go into the details here, but this created no end of controversy. This was especially unfavorable to, um, uh, to the senators. Um, uh, some of it had to do with taking power away from the Senate and giving it to the Equites, but he was also uh, proposing, again, citizenship for uh, the Italians, right? So, um, you know, a lot of this um, uh, was met with resistance um, from various quarters. Uh, and uh, Saturninus um, became especially uh, controversial in the last year um, of, well... Uh, in the year 100, actually, it was. Uh, so he, he was tribune um, that year, and uh, some of his proposals um, ended up drawing the, uh, the ire of um, uh, the senators, um, and uh, riots ended up breaking out uh, between the supporters of Saturninus and the supporters of his senatorial opponents. Um, and Marius ended up siding with the Senate. Um, he, you know put his own troops in places that would guard uh, the interests of the senators, including the Senate House itself. Um, and uh, in the meantime, the, the mob in support, uh, or rather opposed to Saturninus, tracked down Saturninus and some of his supporters in a building, um, and they ended up uh, breaking through the roof of that building and uh, stoning Saturninus and, and uh, some, of the, uh, some of his supporters to death. Um, and Marius's troops stood by and watched this and didn't try to intervene. Um, and Marius ended up being blamed for this. Saturninus had a lot of support um, from various quarters in Rome, and uh, some people saw this saw Marius, uh, you know, saw this as a betrayal on the part of Marius. Um, uh, he he thought that he would gain the you know the gratitude of the Senate for this. Um, but even the senators, you know, were, had a bad taste in their mouth after this whole sequence of events. Um, and Marius ended up kind of withdrawing uh, from public life for a time um, uh, because of all of this. Okay. Now, in the meantime, the issue of Italian citizenship really uh, became the, the hottest issue in Rome in the 90s BCE. So after Marius's withdrawal from the consulship... Um, uh, and the one who, um, uh, the, actually this is the opponent of, um, uh, this is the son of the Livius Drusus who opposed, um, the, the Gracchi, um, if you recall that, right? So there's a new Marcus Livius Drusus, um, who, uh, he, uh, was a tribune in the nineties and, um, uh, ended up being the, the, the main champion of um, uh, kind of the poor and especially of the Italians. And so he once again proposed citizenship for the Italians um, and uh, proposed legislation as tribune in the Concilium Plebis. Um, the uh, noble opponents of this ended up dismissing these things on technicalities. There's all sorts of uh, technicalities that go with conducting of business in the Concilium Plebis and in the Senate and these other bodies, right? And so uh, they dismissed all of this, um, and this led to massive rioting. First of all, Drusus himself was assassinated, which is a little strange. It's uncertain who killed him, actually. It may have been uh, an agent of the Senate. It may have been um, uh, some, one of the Italians um, who was just fed up with this and, and uh, saw Drusus as a failure and uh, took out his frustrations on him. Um, it, you know, it's uncertain exactly, but Drusus dies, and the, the death of Drusus and is kind of the last straw for the Italians, and this plunges Rome into war with its Italian neighbors. 
This is known either as the Italian War or more commonly, more traditionally, as the Social War. Um, and that is after the Latin name for the, um, uh, for the Italians. This was Socii, S-O-C-I-I. Um, it means simply allies, but that's with specific reference to the non-citizen Italian peoples. Okay, so the, the Rome is fighting with them. Uh, s some groups of these ended up uh, breaking away from Rome, uh, declaring the independence of their cities. Uh, they actually set up at a place called Corfinium um, uh, a government um, and uh, elect their own praetors. Um, the Samnites in particular were the chief supporters of this breakaway uh, entity, which they simply called Italia. Uh, they even minted their own coins. Um, the most famous coin of Italia is the one that you see in the upper left here. Um, you can see here a bull, which represents Italia, goring to death a wolf, which is, of course, the symbol of Rome uh, with reference to Romulus and Remus, right? Um, so this is, this is one of the more famous coins in all of Roman history. It's a really interesting source uh, for this this uh, you know two year war here, um, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the social war. Initially, the the uh, Italians win some victories over the Romans. This prompts them to sort of step up the game, um, and the typical players uh, uh, try to get involved with this. And so Marius, through some of his supporters, starts to campaign for a command. Marius is at this point um, about 70 years old and, you know, long past the age of normal retirement for elite Romans, but uh, he still wants a piece of this. He was finally awarded a command, but he ended up being fairly ineffectual. He did win a couple of victories, but they were in fairly minor skirmishes. Um, uh, more effective in this uh, period was um, Lucius Julius Caesar. Now, this is uh, from a different family line of the Iulii Caesares than Julius Caesar himself is. Uh, and so this is a distant cousin of his, right? This is a fairly large patrician family. Um, but uh, he campaigned in southern Italy and largely through diplomacy rather than through military matters. Uh, he was able to strike a peace with many of the Italian allies. Uh, even more importantly, um, Sulla who we've already talked about, uh, he won several victories in this war um, and got a lot of credit for the way that this thing turned out. But the thing that really ended the war was that the Roman senators finally capitulated um, and said, okay, the, most of the Italians can have citizenship. And by, by the end of this war, by 88, after thousands of lives were lost, uh, the Italians got exactly what they wanted in the first place, um, which they had campaigned for, which several Roman politicians had tried to give them over the previous, like, 50 years, and which the senators had always rejected. Finally, uh, as a result of a bloody war, they capitulated and gave it to them, right? So all of the Italians south of the Po River Valley at this point, pretty much, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, are given citizenship. During the war itself, Sulla and, and uh, Lucius Julius Caesar had decreed that all of the Italian cities that had not rebelled, that had not been granted citizenship yet, would be granted citizenship. And anyone who surrendered, even if they were from a place that was rebelling, would be granted citizenship. Um, by 88, there were only a few pockets of resistance left, mostly among the Samnites. And actually, the Samnites end up being nearly obliterated as a result of this. There are very few Samnites left after the end of the Social War. Um, and right as all of this is kind of uh, winding down, um, uh, given the power vacuum left by the death of Attalus III in Pergamum and the, 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 the Romans' attempt to establish a province there, um, control of Asia came to be exercised by the king of Pontus. Pontus is in the northern part of Asia Minor, uh, and this guy's name is Mithridates VI. Um, the bust here uh, on the bottom left of the slide is of Mithridates. You can see he is wearing the head of a lion. Um, that is because he is styling himself after uh, Heracles here, or Hercules. Um, 
Uh, that's always what that means, okay? Um, even though Mithridates presided over a country that was made up mostly of Anatolian peasants, he himself was thoroughly Hellenized. He was very, very much Greek. Um, his, and so we can see this just as an extension kind of of these uh, Hellenistic kingdoms, right? Um, even though it's a, a sort of breakaway kingdom there. Uh, and Mithridates sets himself up as a, a great champion of the Asian cause um, and uh, even sends armies into Roman territory um, and wins some victories over the Roman military. Um, and so this then forces the hand of the Romans, uh, forces them to, to respond. And it's in this atmosphere that Lucius Cornelius Sulla really comes into his own. And so on the back of his success in the social war, uh, Sulla is elected consul in the year 88. And uh, he is given a command to um, uh, go off to Asia and to fight against Mithridates. Um, but, uh, and so that was decreed. Sulla hadn't left yet. And one of the tribunes that year, whose name was um, uh, Sulpicius Rufus, uh, he was of the mold of some of these earlier tribunes like Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus that we've seen. Uh, Rufus was an ally of Marius. Uh, he proposed a whole set of new reforms, um, and, and included, most of which uh, had the effect of stripping power away from the Senate um, uh, and away from Sulla himself, and included in this list of uh, provisions that he tried to, to, that he tried to ram through the Concilium Plebis, was a provision that would strip the command of the the army going off to fight against Mithridates from Sulla and give it to Marius. Okay. Um, and this led to rioting. At one point, um, uh, a mob led by Rufus uh, tracked down Sulla, and Sulla actually had to take refuge um According to the sources, at least, who knows how reliable they are, but uh, according to one tradition, Sulla took refuge in the house of Marius himself, which is a little bit ironic given what happened after this. Um, but he managed to escape Rome, went out to his army, um, and convinced them that uh, their interests would be thwarted um, uh, if they didn't back him in whatever he, he wanted them to do. Now, Sulla had been working himself on creating a client army. He had used this client army during the social war, right? And so he has a bunch of soldiers very loyal to him. Uh, and Sulla at this point makes the fateful decision. Fateful in the sense that um, uh, this is, you know, breaching decorum to an extent that no Roman had ever even thought about breaching before, right? This is, this is taking a step that, that was previously unthinkable, right? We're going to see that the unthinkable becomes thinkable and, and uh, reality over and over and over again um, in these last few decades of the existence of the Republic, right? That step was to take his army into Rome itself and occupy it militarily. And this, it seems, surprised everyone including Marius. Like, he did not anticipate that Sulla would have the gall, the audacity, to do this. Um, and so Sulla marches his army into Rome, um, takes over the city, declares martial law uh, effectively. Um, Marius and Rufus ended up fleeing from the city. Uh, Rufus was actually subsequently tracked down and murdered. Uh, Marius went off to North Africa where many of his soldiers uh, from his uh, army uh, had settled, and he had a great deal of support there, and so he gets away. Um, but Sulla then brings about a number, or rather, he makes uh, several declarations here um, with the support of a lot of senators um, that effectively changes the Constitution. Now, these things are not put fully into effect, into effect at this point. Um, but they will be eventually. And so I'm going to talk about them uh, in due course here. But these have the effect of stripping power away from the tribunes and from the Concilium Plebis itself. 
and putting most of the power into the hands of the Senate. Uh, part of this included making the Comitia Centuriata, the Centurion Assembly, once again the main lawmaking body in Rome, though even that had to do that with the approval of the Senate. It could not bring up any legislation without the Senate's explicit approval. He also set limits on uh, the age at which men could seek certain offices. Uh, and most importantly, um, with the Tribune, uh, he made it, he, he, he rammed through a law that decreed that anyone who became Tribune could no longer be eligible to seek higher office. So, so a, tri a former Tribune could not, for instance, become a praetor or a consul, which had become one of the normal paths to power at this point. Right Now, he was not able to put these fully into place, uh, and in fact, he sort of lost the initiative um, uh, as he was organizing his army to go off to the east to fight against Mithridates. The elections happened, and an opponent of his, whose name was Kinna, uh, now Kinna was somewhat allied with Marius, but really Kinna had a great deal of ambition on his own. Uh, he is elected as consul for the year 87, um, and Sola departs for the east, recognizing that Kinna was probably going to try to undo a lot of the things that he did in his taking of the city. And in fact, Kinna does that, right? Now, um, uh, he goes, Sola goes off to fight against Mithridates, and in the meantime, his supporters are not able to stop... Um, a group of uh, supporters of Kinna and Marius from retaking the city militarily. So, you know, within one year, we, we have a, a second instance of a politician bringing soldiers into the city and taking it over militarily. In this case, it's this group of Populares um, uh, under the command of Kinna and Marius. And they then control the elections in the year 87. Marius, at age like 73 or 74, stands for the election as consul, which he achieves. He's elected as consul for 86. Uh, a week or two into his term as consul, Marius dies. Um, now, and so Marius is out of the picture, but his supporters were at this point firmly in control of the city. However... Um, in the intervening couple of years, and I'm sort of glossing over a lot of details here, Kinna and uh, the allies of Marius were making plans to try to stop what they saw as the inevitable eventuality of Sulla coming back with his army and trying to take over the city again. And they were astute in doing this, right? They knew that Sulla was going to do that. Uh, at one point, Kinna puts together an army and uh, is trying to um, organize it to go off and... Um, sorry, I'm going to go back to the previous slide here. Uh, to go off and fight against uh, uh, Sulla in Asia rather than allow him to get back to Italy. Um, and uh, Kinna was not particularly popular among some of these uh, troops he had recruited. And at one point, um, he did something, and I'm not actually sure what, uh, that really ticked them off. And they mutinied and killed Kinna. And so now Marius is dead, and the next most ambitious able man, uh, kind of in command of the Populares, is also dead. Uh, the guy who becomes consul in the next year, his name is Carbo, uh, becomes the kind of the overall leader of this contingent. But they are in a state of real disarray here, right? In the meantime, Sola was having success in the east. Rather than go straight for Mithridates, um, he put down some revolts in Greece because with the rise of Mithridates and with news of the chaos in Rome, um, cities like Athens had uh, declared independence. Um, and so he marched his troops into Athens um, and uh, put a portion of that city to the torch and killed a lot of people and kind of cowed them into submission. He also raided the Temple of Apollo at Delphi and sent uh, many of the statues and other things back. Uh, to Rome, um, and so nothing is sacrosanct at this point. The holiest site in all of uh, the Greek world is, has now been raided by Sulla. And then he took his army into Asia Minor and fought a few engagements with Mithridates, but he recognized that if this dragged on for too long, 
that um, he was not going to, um, that the things were going to get away from him in Italy, right? Um, and so he ended up making a rather hurried peace with Mithridates. Um, uh, as part of that, he forced Mithridates to accept an indemnity of 2,000 talents of gold, um, which flowed directly to Sulla himself, which helped him um, uh, continue to pay his army. Um, you can see here, by the way, this uh, coin, which Sulla minted, um, and you'll note the name, or rather the word Felix on here, okay? Felix um, means lucky, and this is actually the thing that Sulla, in his own opinion of himself, um, seems to have seen as his greatest attribute. He was lucky, okay? So uh, he put this on all of his coins and things. Uh, this seems to have been a kind of identity marker for him, right? Okay, so after settling all of those affairs with Mithridates, um, he returns to Rome. Now, as I said, there was a mutiny against Cinna. He's dead, um, and the forces uh, who were in support of the Populares are in disarray. Uh, Sulla marches his army to the city. Um, he uh, actually many of the many of the Populares end up kind of the support for them end up, ends up melting away. Sulla takes the city. Easily, um, the the most important uh, opponents here were the last some of the last remaining Samnites um, uh, who massed their army at the Colline Gate. Um, they they put up the fiercest resistance to Sulla, um, but he ended up smashing through their defenses and taking the city. Um, and then he sent out his soldiers to hunt down Samnites in the mountains. And this is you know this is akin to genocide. This is where the, the Samnites are almost entirely wiped out. Um, in the year 82, once things had settled down, um, allies of Sulla in the Senate um, uh, pushed through a decree that made Sulla dictator. Okay. Um, and in the meantime, after taking the city, now I'll, I'll get to the dictator point in a second. And after taking the city, Sulla's troops had tracked down uh, supporters of the Populares, um, among them several dozen senators and several hundred equites, and assassinated them. And Sulla started to issue lists of men that he felt were disloyal to Rome, and what that meant really was disloyal to Sulla and his cause. Um, but because he had pushed through these constitutional changes, he could uh, manufacture charges of uh, sort of any sort here, okay? Um, these reprisal killings ended up claiming the lives of about 90 senators and about 2,600 equites, at least that's according to the sources that we have. Um, and so, you know, th these are what are called the prescriptions of Sulla, right? Importantly, they didn't just kill these men, they also laid claim to their property. And so, you know, by virtue of opposing Sulla, uh, they declared that their property was uh, reverted to the Roman state, um, and so it wasn't just these men die who died, it was also their families who were killed or impoverished by being kicked off of their land. And then Sulla used that land uh, to distribute, first of all, to he held auctions for this, um, and his supporters ended up snatching up a lot of this land for um, uh, quite cheap prices. Um, and then he also took some of that land himself and, and used it to shower favors upon his uh, favorites, upon the, the people who were his um, uh, greatest supporters, right? Uh, included among that were his veterans. And so one of the uh, chief concerns of a commander of a client army was to provide pensions uh, and rewards for their soldiers, and so a lot of the prescriptions ended up, or rather the land seized as part of the prescriptions, went to the veterans of Sulla's army. And so they were thrilled with him, uh, and he continued to draw a great deal of support. Now in the year 82, Sulla is decreed dictator, with the proviso that the traditional six-month term of dictatorship would not be observed. Sulla ends up being dictator for three years. During that time, he continued the prescriptions, and uh, probably upwards of 10,000 people uh, of various classes in Rome 
uh, were killed as part of this um, cleansing effort on, uh, you know, uh, in, in Sola's program, right? Um, and uh, the constitutional changes that he had decreed um, when he had previously taken the city uh, were put fully into effect, and he continued to make constitutional changes that had the effect of establishing the Senate as the supreme voice in all domestic and foreign affairs of Rome. This completely um, sidelined the concilium plebis and the tribunes and really any recourse that, I mean, he turned the clock back about 300 years in doing this, okay? Back to the early days of the uh, the, the conflict of the orders, um, uh, took power almost entirely away from plebeians. Uh, there still were tribunes, but they were stripped of their... Um, ability to propose laws and of their veto, um, and uh, no um, ambitious person of any capability, uh, given the limitations put on the Tribune, was going to seek that office. And so the, the Tribunes who were elected after this were really not good representatives of plebeian interests. Um, and, uh, you know, this, anyway, uh, that was all part of Sola's plan here. Um, he restocked the Senate by... Um, uh, taking uh, several hundred of his equestrian or his supporters among the equites, the, the translation of that, by the way, is equestrian, so I'm just going to use the English here. So about 300 equestrian supporters um, and putting and, and decline, you know, giving them senatorial status, and so they um, he, he stocked the Senate with a lot of his supporters, he increased the size of the Senate from about 300 to about 600 at this point, um, and the majority of them were... Um, beholden to him, allies of him, and dependent on him for that status in the first place. He also imposed age restrictions on gaining imperium, and in fact on gaining uh, any of the offices in the Crucis Honorum. One had to be at least 30 years old, for instance, before being elected quaestor. One had to be at least 39 before being elected as praetor, and one had to be at least 42 before being elected as consul. Um, and uh, other limitations on seeking those offices. One had to be a quaestor and an edil before one could be elected as a praetor or a consul, for instance, right? So you had to follow the path of each of these. You couldn't skip through them, and there was no way to become tribune and then achieve any of the offices in the Crucis Honorum, all right? Um, and so, I mean, there were, there's more to this, um, but uh, Sola's program had the effect, as I said, of turning the clock back about two to 300 years um, and Sulla retired in 79, thinking that his legacy was secure and that uh, he had refashioned Rome the way it ought to be, but he was, of course, wrong in that regard. Um, he died only about a year later, um, and uh, there was no one uh, willing to continue with um, the... Uh, ex with the extreme lengths that Sulla had gone to reshape Rome. And, and that's, imp that's an important thing. But Sulla, on the other hand, sets a precedent here. The precedent is not only in the use of his client army and in attacking, not, not being afraid of attacking the city itself, um, which are important precedents, but also in the use of the dictatorship in ways that were totally unprecedented in Rome, that now becomes possible, right? It becomes imaginable for Romans because Sulla had done it. Others now see that as justified for them to do. And included among that number are figures like Catiline and especially Julius Caesar. And so we'll turn our attention to the aftermath of Sulla next time. Um, I know I've rushed through a lot of this. Hopefully it's all made sense.